Hello and welcome back to the Facts of Facts, the only Facts of Life podcast that would honestly be more than happy to open up for Robert Klein. How are you, Britt? Um, good, aside from, um, I, so the, the good thing about this is that I, is that about this episode is that, um, um, it was short. I mean, they're all the uh, same length, besides the two parters. But that's the thing is that once you've go, gone through the two, the fire of the two parters, the, the, the regular, the regular sized episodes feel brisk in comparison. However, I, I, we're through the we're through the wilderness. We don't have one until the finale. Yes. So, for, but okay, I, however, how, however, I will say this: this episode, for being you know twenty two or twenty three minutes long, felt very very long to me because there was too much going on and not enough of anything. Well, we did have a B plot. Uh, it, it was barely a B plot. A G plot. <laughs> very. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, let's, uh, let's get into it. I didn't hate this one. I felt like the beginning was a lot more fun than the second half. It was like, they were like, we have a certain amount of jokes per episode we need to put in. We're going to put all of them in the first half and none of them in the second half. So, um, in that regard, I do feel like, yeah, you, uh, you're right that it, it, uh, it felt slow. The, the, the end game was a slog, but, uh, but the beginning was fun and peppy. It was what price glory, which yeah. I don't, I, I mean, okay. What price horseradish mustard might've been a better, um, title, but, uh, right. That's the problem. Our, the person who's introduced in this episode, Jeff Williams, is that his name? Yes. Um, uh, wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the horseradish mustard and any sort of morning glory or glory in general. Hello. Yeah. Um, lemon mustard sounds nice. I don't think I've ever had lemon mustard. I mean, I've had like a lemon mustard sauce, but just lemon mustard as a thing. So I've never I, imagined it, and it sounds great. It's so funny because I it's is that um, at the beginning of this episode I paused it to just fully inspect, but, but like the items that Mrs. Garrett has stocked in Edna's Edibles. Oh, I like and, that. And it's like, and I, I immediately I noticed I was like, "Fuck, they have so much mustard!" Like I in my house I have a lot of, I think I currently in this house we probably have four or five types of mustard. Edna's edibles blows me out of the water. Yeah, well I mean it is a fine food shop. It is. Yes. Um so a directed by Azad Kalada. Yes. Continuing his streak. Um really showing up to work. Uh we found another door in this episode. <laughs> We'll get to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know I'm obsessed with this, um, so I'm very excited about Door Watch. But before we do that, let's talk about our writer because he is a one and doneer here. Yes, I have, and here's, and I know, I know that I'm stepping on 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 you know your role, but I have some things to say about this man who wrote this. Are you familiar with him? Um, only because I was like, who the hell wrote this, this thing? And did this, how was this person responsible for any other things in the facts of life? No. Nope. And I yeah. was like, oh, God. But and what's interesting yeah. is this is his second episode of television that he ever wrote. Um, yeah. And his first episode uh, of television was Working Stiffs, which was a Jim Belushi, Michael Keaton sitcom that aired only three episodes in uh, 1978, I believe. Do you want to tell? Do you want to say what this man's name is? So his name's Alan Spencer. Um, in high school, he had said in his yearbook that his dream was to work with Mel Brooks, and he eventually will. Yes. Um, but before that, he will sneak onto the set of Young Frankenstein and befriend Marty Feldman. It, exactly. So this is these are the sort of hijinks that this guy is capable of. Yes. He uh, also, uh, he seems like he was an interesting fellow because uh, he, in uh, a co two years prior to this episode, he uh, had a 48 hour play date with Andy Kaufman, where yeah. he watched uh, 
nonstop marathon of the People's Court, which Andy Kaufman had meticulously recorded. It sounds like literally um, my idea of excruciating and annoying torture. Like, I can't I imagine. would love that. I, I probably could stay up without any additional help eh, um, for two days uh, if I was hanging out with Andy Kaufman, but I'm sure I wouldn't need to worry about that. Um, he. It was, it's mostly because of the Andy Kaufman of it all. I would find that very annoying. But also, I, I, I was a fan. He was, he was very, he, they were like lifelong friends after yes. that incident, like until Kaufman died. Yes, that is correct. So the other thing about this guy is that he was, he was actually pretty, he's incredibly well regarded as a script doctor in Hollywood. That's like his big thing. Like he, and, and that's, I mean, you know, um, lots of, Carrie Fisher was a well-known script doctor, you know, like a lot of people in Hollywood are, you know, it's, 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 you know, kind of a known secret that if you give someone like something to punch and they add in some good stuff, then it's, it's, they don't, they might not get like credit credit, but like it's regarded in the industry as like, that's actually something that is a talent. And I think he's, he contributed to a lot of films. I, I've script doctored twice two mm -hmm. movies that actually got made. Um, I, I don't think I'm very good at it. <laughs> but, and the other thing that's funny about him, what was I gonna, um, is that I think he was one of the youngest people ever inducted into the WGA. I think he was like inducted when he was like a teenager. Yes, yes, yeah. that is interesting. And um, he also wrote the never produced uh, fourth quill, uh, uh, Naked Gun, What For, the number, ah. colon, The Rhythm of Evil, which I love the title. Yeah, so that sounds amazing. Yes. Um, he also wrote um, a, a, a show on, and I'm, I can't remember what network it aired, but it was a it was called Sledgehammer. Oh yeah, Sledgehammer is huge. Yeah, um, starring David Rash, who's like the funniest man ever. He David Rash also um, was in you know Burn After Reading and In the Loop. It's like a very tall, handsome, blonde, officious looking man. But Sledgehammer was sort of, as I understand it, I don't think I don't think I've ever seen it, but it's sort of. I think it was just sort of in the ether in the 80s. It was like from like on from like 86 to 88 or something. Yes. And it was like Dragnet, but like a more hyper violent, less capable. Like it's like the cop who always goes to the worst decision possible. Yes, it was like Dragnet with a hint of Naked Gun. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, I, I liked it quite a bit. I think I have the DVD somewhere. Um, but that uh, was, in fact, his third writing gig. Sorry? In your DVD closet. Yeah. Well, no, I have a shelf. Um, but uh, uh, that was his third writing gig was Sledgehammer. Um, before that, he'd only done Working Stiffs and this episode of Facts of Life. Um, he also eventually got to achieve his dream of working with Mel Brooks on um, the Harvey Corman Cloris Leachman sitcom The Nut House, which I adore it's insane and i uh i do have bootleg dvds of most of the series i think i'm missing a couple episodes it's so good and so weird um he also wrote the movies the ghost writer hexed a movie which he also directed which was when uh, hollywood was trying to make ari gross happen which ne sadly never did um galaxy beat the tomorrow man and of course the 2006 movie have You Seen My Manhood, which he also directed, and could have been the name for the season premiere of Facts of Life. It certainly could have been. Um, his final credit was a 2012 Eddie Izzard Eric Roberts show called Bullet to the Face, which apparently can be seen on Amazon Prime, and I believe I'm going to have to, I think it's like six episodes. It might be, it feels British, because Eddie Izzard, six episodes, and I've never heard of it. So that combination of things... Tells me it might be British, um, and, but yeah. And I'll, I'll say anything with Eric Roberts in it is worth watching because talk about an actor who makes the most chaotic decision. Like between, well, I'm gonna treat this like a regular normal thing. And it's like, no, I'm gonna, you know, um, leap off a cliff while singing an aria from the Mikado. Like it's like the most, he does crazy stuff. So I'm sure, report back.
You can do, we can do I'm a, a huge Eric Roberts fan because he was in the sitcom Less Than Perfect, mm -hmm. which uh, also had Sarah Rue and Sherry Shepard and Andy Dick and Will oh, yeah. Sasso, um, uh, 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 Zachary Levy. It was truly one of my favorite modern day sitcoms that exists and he was a huge part of it i met with the producers of it and um they gave me some great eric roberts stories which i shouldn't share here but um <laughs> they're really he, he seems like uh such a fun person to work with yes uh <clears throat> anyway credits alert so we just do this thing where we can pull pamela seagal out of the credits when we want she's not in the episode she's not in the credits very interesting. I don't think I've seen that kind of um, loosey goosiness with opening credits basically anywhere else. Uh, maybe since the first season of this show. Yeah, but like they had a lot of like those credits stayed the same. They were just, and there was just a lot of people in them. This is what's interesting is like they removed Pamela Segal and they left this really long shot of Nancy McKeon being like. <laughs> Just uh, for those listening, I like smiled and moved my hands and head back and forth like I was laughing at a joke. Um, it was really weird. It was like, why so much Nancy McKee? Um, and then I realized that Pamela Skull was missing, which uh, well, I'm just saying it's interesting that like if you usually if you're in the credits, you're in the credits until you've been written out of the show. But yeah. uh, or, or you're in the credit once you're in the credits you're good but to be in the credits when you're just like a shoplifter for one scene and then not in the credits and then you come back when you are it's weird to me but um you know a little spoilery uh yeah. in a way but i guess we didn't care about that too much back in the day anyway shall we open this episode yes all right i'm ready where do we open edna's edibles what yeah, well, there's really there's going to be basically three choices: the living room, Edna's edibles, or the bedroom. Mm. Um, so I don't have we seen the bedroom yet? We have not. So since we have not, <laughs> it's not going to be that yet. We have we have two locations. It is weird that we haven't seen the bedroom yet. Yeah, because it feels like um, uh, to be uh, um, it feels as though like from what you were just saying about you know Pamela Adlon you know being in or Pamela Seagal being in the credits, having a scene, and then not being in this season. It feels as though maybe they were, um, they were like um, airing them out of order. I don't know. That is possible. It is possible. They were like, let's give Tootie a boyfriend. And then they were like, oh, this one's really heavy with all the reading in it. And like, I, I don't know. It could have been aired out of order. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. Yeah. Um, interesting take. I like that. All right. So uh, Blair is bubbling. Oh. Which pisses Joe off. Yeah. So so um, Blair comes in wearing, she looks like Grimace from McDonald's. She's wearing an aggressive. She looks like Grimace from McDonald's. Like, oh, I thought you meant Grimace from the, the, the band The National. Not a lot of people, I mean, maybe, I mean, people our age and slightly younger, I guess, would know who Grimace is. But I think not, that the facts of Lovelies know who Grimace is. Fair enough. Okay, well, in any case, she looked like Grimace, okay? She was wearing she a giant. Grimace from who? Which Grimace? The Grimace from McDonald's. And oh, as okay. we, we, I think I was having, was I having this conversation with you about Grimace? What I learned about Grimace? Grimace is the embodiment of a taste bud. So presumably his entire body can taste. Yeah, and it's not even like it's a tongue, even though he's tongue shaped. It he's is like a, one what? bud that hangs out in your tongue. It's just a giant one. You ever like bite your tongue and it gets swollen? Yeah. That's a little and baby Grimace. And if you don't yeah. take care of it, that's what you get. Yes, you get a giant purple Blair in your mouth. Anyway, so Blair comes in screaming. Sort of like the entire freshman class got, according to Joe. And that was the other thing about this episode, is that the sex jokes were, yeah. were in left and right. And Tootie gets a new boyfriend. Tootie still looks relatively young. She looks like she still has a baby face. This new boyfriend, not only does he tower over her, but he looks 
25. And then let's also um, acknowledge that once she gets the boyfriend, she dresses like a giant toddler in big red overalls, really, yes. really accentuating their age difference. Yeah, she looks sort of like my buddy and me. Yeah, I wrote like an evil red Chucky. Yeah, either. <laughs> Yours is right. Yours is 100% right. They dressed her down into making her look even more infantile. And so the age difference was far more severe seeming. And it's weird because, honestly, I think in the first scene, Tootie looks pretty good. She looks, uh, no, so it, it's she not looks like, mature, look, like a little bit older, not wearing overalls. And she flirts her ass off. Oh, expertly. I mean, I wouldn't say expertly. It was a little bit too like, ha-ha, Mae West, you want to come over and and sit on my lap? Ha-ha. <laughs> well, you know, it was, it was, he was clearly the right audience because he does yes. it back to her. It was working. It did work. <laughs> Um, it, yeah, so, so so Blair bursts in. She's bubbling, and Joe's like, "I hate it when you bubble." And I was like, "But you don't hate it. But you don't hate it when she squirts." So, um, uh, yeah, she says she answered the prayers of the entire freshman class, and Joe is like, "Blair, <laughs> are children about?" Uh, yeah. Which it's like I was not expecting two seconds into this episode to have the vision of like a bukkake Blair Warner. But, but now I do. Thank but, you, Joe. We started there this in this beginning of this season with Bukaki Blair. That is true. We did. So, yeah, so is the this return a, of Bukaki Blair. Is this a callback? Anyway, so this is where I paused because I was like, I need to take a look at what's on these shelves. And there was this behind Joe, just like a row of hundreds of mustards. Hundreds. Like the big French one, the little French one. Like there was like a bigger American one. It was just all the mustards. And I was Isn't like- it funny that French's mustard is an American mustard? Yeah, that's hilarious. Anyway, but the other thing I noticed was that- Rude. <laughs> is that below the shelf of mustards and what looked like, I suppose, olive oil was a huge shelf of biscuits called boudoirs. Yeah, boudoir biscuits. And I was like, what is happening with these set decorators? Like these people are like- More like You're... sex decorators. Exactly, I was like, we're gonna go in hardcore with the mustard and then we're gonna come in with, like they're visible on screen. Like the box, they're two boxes. Did you Google boudoirs? Cause I saw them and I thought about it and I forgot to do it. Of course I did. Ah, uh -huh. that's why you're the best. Yeah, so boudoirs are lady fingers. They're, they were created in, the, the, there's the boudoir brand, which I think was made by the Louis Cookie Corporation or something. I mean, Ooh, they're, la, la. yeah. Um, but um, they were, they're called boudoirs, which are well known as lady fingers. Within the Orthodox Jewish community, they're known as baby fingers, which I'm not sure if that's better or worse or equally Depends gross. Depends on what you do with them. Well, um, they're a, it's, they're a crunchy biscuit made with fresh eggs, which you eat with, which you either eat plain or you can use them in a tiramisu. But may I say, aren't lady fingers not crunchy? They are crunchy. They're aren't they soft. No, so they get they get Whose soft. Fingers have I been eating? Are Baby they man fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Those soft man fingers you've been eating. Anyway, no, so um. The, the boudoir uh, biscuits were um, given its name by the French diplomat Talleyrand, who enjoyed dipping them in Madeira during his visits to boudoirs because that's where he was discussing diplomacy in private. I see. Is that what we're calling it now? Yes. Or back then? In private. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's how it is with me and my husband in our boudoir. There's a lot of there's a lot of negotiation and a lot of diplomacy in private. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Blair doesn't even clarify this no. with Joe and Tootie, who's looking nice, uh, stares along and kind of gives Joe like a don't bukaki Blair in your imagination. Uh, Blair saunters over to Mrs. Garrett and announces that she's pulled a Mrs. Garrett today. And Which, I'm like, so you learned how to like fly a plane, but then never did it? Yeah, I thought, 
I, I thought this is so unlike Blair because Blair's always the one with her brilliant ideas. She would never give credit to Mrs. Garrett for having done something smart. Well, pulling a Mrs. Garrett could mean a lot of things. It could mean you got to an audience with a child pornographer and a pimp. It could mean you could... decided to make Mexican food, even though that was the chic thing to eat last month. You don't know what pulling a Mrs. Garrett is. It could be... That's true. That's right, Mrs. Garrett. Or, or going to France to steal other people's recipes that you immediately forget how to cook. Uh-huh. Which is yeah. just add shallots. <laughs> the one... Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um... So what Blair did was that she brought Cousin Jerry back into our lives. <laughs> yeah, so, what it, so, it's, so there's this big rockin' freshman night, opening yes. night party. And yes, there's gonna be a rock band. A rock band, do, do, we, do we hear which rock band it possibly is? No. We do not, and we will talk about bands in the future, but not this time. It's just <laughs> anonymous rock band. If it's a comedian, it's Robert Klein. If it's a rock band, don't mention it. Yeah, but we've but we've discussed rock bands and musicians before on this. Yeah, I know. I felt like they were like really like afraid to besmirch the reputation of you know Finley? Twisted Sister or whoever it was right. that they were going to say dropped out at the last minute. But not Robert Klein, who was who will show up to speak. Well, that's to the thing. They're not saying anything. You know, Robert Klein. If you're in a jam, call Robert Klein. You're saying something positive about Robert Klein. He's dependable, reliable, um, not busy to play a freshman college night. It's like not even for all, the whole college. It's like just the young losers. Yeah. In peak skill. And in 1983, which makes sense that people like 17 year olds in 1983 would know who Robert Klein is and be a big fan. Well, Cousin Jerry is. Um, did, I wonder if Cousin Jerry sold, like, I'm not drunk, I just have CP merchandise at her shows, shirts or hats. Why not? She should. She definitely should. I would. But he's like, you can't. I mean, back then, you could probably wear it. But now, I don't think that that would be appropriate. But back then, it would probably be completely overlooked yeah um a sea of cousin jerry fans that, that in the audience that just and lined up with her during the meet and greet where everyone is just like i'm not drunk i just it's, everybody, it's a bunch of people with like bowl cuts and ridiculous turtlenecks yeah they're cosplaying as cousin jerry <laughs> <laughs> um so uh mrs gad points out that blair has not told mrs J mrs mrs jerry hasn't told cousin jerry yet so it's just half of Mrs. Garrett. Yeah. So she uh, had I thought what we could call a half what we could call a half of Mrs. Garrett could be like an Edgar. Okay. A Narette. Narette. Narette, okay. <laughs> Either way, it's not a full Edna. Um, yeah. Blair stands in the center of the room and monologues her plot that we have just witnessed. Yes. Um, she booked up freshman night, she got her cousin a job. She's going to be the next Don Kirshner. I had to Google it. I was like, I don't know who this man is. I didn't know who he was either. And like, I, you're, I, you're the big, you're more of a music nerd than I am. He was the, the manager of the monkeys. He, he was, was a, the man with the golden ear. Yeah. According to Time Magazine in like 1975 or whatever. But he like he, Kansas and the Archies as well. Yeah. A big he music. A big musical pu pu uh, uh, pr not producer, but also um, publisher. So he yes. likes like Carol King, you know, and like people like that. But like and like Bobby Darin, yeah, as you said, Kansas. And I was just sort of like, this is the reference. Such a weird reference for this. 1983 for these girls who are it's watching. It's a weird reference under any circumstances. It's a weird reference. Like it does not really relate to the fact that Tootie. I'm sorry, that Blair helped book up, I guess, because she booked up a concert. And, but like, it's a comedian. It's just, it's so strange. It's such a reach. It was as though the writer was told, like, I, I will give you $500 if you can get Don Kirshner into a Facts of Life script. And he's like, done. I'm going to do it. And you know, it's so you, strange. Don Kirshner is also. 
You know who said that to him? The writer? Can, I'll give you $500 if you can get Don Kirshner into an episode of The Facts of Life. Andy, Don Kirshner. Oh. Andy Kaufman. Andy Kaufman was like, do that. <laughs> You'll be my king and friend forever. Probably. That, that, <laughs> that makes sense to me. That makes more sense than most of this episode. Yeah. Um, uh, he was even a music consultant for the two most interchangeable sitcoms of the 60s. Yes, he was. Bewitched and I Dream of Jeannie. Yeah. He died in 2011 and was posthumously inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2012. He had a TV show in the 70s where he hosted rock concerts. Did you watch him talk at all? No. This guy I, has I, negative I charisma. I read that he it was is like so wooden on camera. It's so like, weird. He's like, but he also has like a thick accent, like a thick kind of like New York accent. So he's like, this next band's gonna be huge in the charts. Kansas. It's so strange. It's just it's very it was very weird. Like I couldn't stop watching him. Like I lost I had a limited time to do my notes and I lost like a chunk of 20 minutes of because I was just watching him introduce bands. It's great. Look it up on YouTube. I loved it. Um, <laughs> Joe tells Blair to stop flapping her gums and start counting pickled eggs. Okay. Is, it, okay. Is that how inventory works? Like pickled eggs need to be individually inventoried? So no, it doesn't. And then right after this is another go count round food objects joke. Yes, olives. Olives, as though that is how inventory works. No. Like, don't they have like a bucket of olives? A barrel, sorry. Yeah, I mean, they've got all those barrels, but they also have a lot of, I, and I imagine that maybe the pickled eggs you do need to count because I imagine that those are sold individually, like at a really gross dive bar, you can have a pickled egg. But- I feel like they're in the jar. And they it's are like- well, Does no. the jar look like we need to put more eggs in the pickling solution? No. Not there's 17. I'm just yep. like, I understand like the horseradish mustards. Are we selling a lot of horseradish mustard? Sure. Yes. But the pickled eggs, you just like you're just gonna put more eggs in there. That's it. Like just look at them, decide. Do you yeah. need more eggs? Don't put no, it on the inventory. Joe, but this is the thing, is that this this is the only thing that Joe has to do in this episode, which is yell at people about inventory. Yeah. And, and, and so she gets all these dumb things to say about like how to, you know, if you give away sandwiches, we're not going to be, we're going to go out of business, dumb shit like that. But she also, the thing is, is that, um, uh, Joe adopts the worst tone of voice possible. She's, you, she's at this high register of annoyance in her voice where she's like, stop flapping your gums and get back to get, counting the pickled eggs. And it's like, where is this hysteria coming from? Here's my theory on this. Joe just had a, a, yet another one of those episodes that was all about her where she has a glow up and has to be put in a gown. I have noticed that at the, the episodes after one of those, Joe is very light. It's as though that drains her energy being okay. in the dress. And so then she's not on her game and they keep her out of the pl main plot so that she can just kind of screech in the background until yeah. she's back to her normal self again. Yeah, that makes sense. That's my theory. Um, but yeah, no, it does seem like these girls do not know how inventory works. Um, but Natalie wants to take a break from counting her olives so that she can help this handsome customer that walked in. However, the handsome customer is black, and according to 80s TV and movie romance rules, that means he belongs to Judy. Automatic. Which, she points out. She yeah. swats Nat away. See what I did there? Yeah. Um, silent G. Uh, and goes to help Jeff. So now it's the time of the episode where we talk about Jeff. Mm -hmm. You ready? Yes. Okay. He's played by Todd Hollowell. And I actually have a friend who knows him. Oh. She found out about the podcast. And then the next day she went to a family friend's funeral. It was oh, an gosh. older woman, um, and it turned out to be Todd Hallowell's grandmother. Wow. And somehow, the facts of life came up, and she told him about the podcast. So, we at least know that now two people in the Facts of Life universe, Mindy Cohen and Todd Hallowell, know 
what we're doing over here. So that's pretty cool. I'm actually going to try to get him on uh, the podcast for uh, one of his future episodes. So, so <clears throat> when we just get into like who, who he is, you and I, as I recall, you told me this, I think last week, is that um, he's a, he, he basically becomes regular in many ways, right? He, his last episode is episode 20 of season nine. So he's he's her boyfriend for all of this. He's her one and only from now on. So does she teach him how to read? It's not really discussed. I think it's like he agrees and between episodes, he figures it out. Cause we well, don't talk about it anymore. I see, okay. The big thing about this 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 episode is the fact that he doesn't know how to read. Yes. And that is the only thing that we know about him, aside from the fact that he's hot, tall, and plays football. Fantastic at football. But he doesn't know how to read. Yes. And then never- He's charming enough that he can get everybody to cheat for him. And then that's never brought up again. No. I don't (laughs) think so. I really don't think so. because in my head, I was always like, after this episode, I was like, oh, thank God, Jeff knows how to read now. So whenever this episode would come up, I'd be like, oh, God, it's the one that Jeff doesn't know how to read. And then I'd be like, okay, he can read now. So that's how I felt about Jeff. But we, we're going to have, we're going through this together. So yeah. we will find out for sure if there are any subtle things like pass the horseradish mustard. And he just looks at her like, fuck you, Tootie. And then she's like, oh, never mind. I'll get it. I know you don't know. Uh, something subtle that I missed, but we'll find out. Um, anyway, Todd got his start here on the Facts of Life. I but like him. He's very not charming. as Jeff. Oh, yes. He's... He was. He played Zach Peters in the episode "Dear Me," where Tootie wrote a love letter to herself so she can get out of going on a sex field trip with a bunch of Bates boys. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now, in my head, he could have kind of been Jeff. Um, because he was, because Jeff goes to Bates. Yeah. You know, but, uh, but no, he was Zach Peters. Um, and that's fine. The chemistry was there and it was so, because I remember from watching it, it was so palpable that they brought him back to be Jeff and he'll be on a total of nine episodes, um, throughout the rest of the series. So he's not like he's on all the time, but there's a lot of like the specter of Jeff, like Jeff, well, I think he goes to the military and there's a lot of like, like Jeff sent me this thing and things like that. I like the notion of the specter of Jeff haunts the facts of life for the next three seasons. You know, it's like, okay. Um, but I, I will wish say, it was three seasons. Yeah, four seasons, whatever. But it's that I do, I, is that, we well, said nine. That he yeah, well, nine. I'm counting this one. Oh, okay. Well, so what I was just going to say is that when you see them flirting, I was like, I want to see this. This is the fun of the episode. No, we don't get that. We will from now on. Like, that is their vibe. He's never, like, a dick. Um, he is kind of a dick in this episode. Kind of. But <laughs> what, a bit more well, than kind of. Because she constantly keeps screaming about him, about the fact that he can't read. She keeps saying, I can't believe this. You don't know how to read? You don't know how to read? What? I can't believe this. How do you not know how to read? I teach you. I basic kids that know how to read. And you don't know how to read? It's like she keeps hammering him about like the one big insecurity that he has. And so of course he's like, actually, yeah, it sucks. I, you know, I mean, the reading thing is bad, but like, I'm good at football. And she's like, I can't believe that you don't know how to read. And he's like, I still like you. Will you wear my necklace? And she's like, but you can't read. (laughs) Well, spoiler alert, but we will get into all of it. Uh, but yes, she is. She harps on it. She's intense about it. And I don't blame him for freaking out. I don't think she handled it great on multiple levels, but um, she did handle it. Um, but more about him. He After Facts of Life, after this episode, he was in The Jerk 2. Ah. Yeah, even jerkier. Um, he donated. He donated. It's funny because I was about to say he dated Denise Cosby. Donated Denise. Um... Uh, for an episode of The Cosby Show, and then he worked with her again on the pilot of A Different World. Um, different character, too. I assume seems he... to be his thing, because he does that again on Hill Street Blues. He plays two different characters. Um, 
and he also does an Amen, which I loved Amen. I don't know about you. I was a big Amen fan. I don't really even know what that is. Yeah, it was a religious sitcom in the 80s, uh, often paired with 227 on Saturdays. Um, he, his final role would be as Jeff on season 20 of, ep- I'm sorry, episode 20 of season nine. Brit just craps herself, season 20. <laughs> I was like, I had a panic attack. Like, literally, like, my bowels fell out of the bottom of my body. Yes, his last episode of Facts of Life is when Pippa and Andy lose his grandmother's pendant. Oh, no. Christ. Yeah, you should probably be like, so there's three episodes left of the Facts of Life, and they did a Pippa-Andy-Jeff episode in (laughs) season nine. So that's where we're going to be going. Uh, I actually love Pippa, and Andy is me, so I'm fine with Pippa and Andy episodes. Um, There's also, um, there was a guy in a Playgirl magazine that I found in my sister's bedroom when I was a kid. Looked just like Jeff. Just like Jeff. Like, I was like, I wonder if that's, but I Googled it, so I I actually, did I? Yes, later in life, when I had the internet, I remembered, I watched an episode of Facts of Life, and I was like, oh yeah, and I was at the time certain that it was Jeff in Playgirl, uh, and then I Googled, it took me forever to find that issue, and I found the guy's name, and of course it could be a stage name, but it didn't really look like him <laughs> anymore. Well, what a, um, thank you for taking me on that journey. Yeah, yeah I put <laughs> it in my notes, so I had to say it. Anyway, uh, Jeff pats his tummy, Oh. He says he's real hungry. And Tootie's like, you want quiche, Greek salad, or tortellini with three, two very hard teas? Yeah, she's, we have Greek salad, tortellini, and a terrific quiche. And he's like, I want a sandwich. Bitch, make me a sandwich. I thought yeah. that's literally the origin of that bitch, make me a sandwich joke that is all over the, as you, you know, the internet that you now have access to. No, it's not. He was like, I just want a hero sandwich. And she was like, you'd make a hero out of any sandwich you ate. I I wrote down, what? Blair looks horrified. But Natalie's like, yeah, get that D. Yeah. Natalie- <laughs> like, it was like the two of them trained each other. Natalie was like, okay, if he brings up food, I have a whole bunch of one-liners that you can use. So yeah. if it's sandwich, it's going to be this. Um, the thing is, is that it's like, is that he comes in, he's like, um, you know, I'm, I'm hungry while rubbing his stomach. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And she's like, well, we have this delightful Greek salad. We have our tortellini and then a terrific quiche. And then he's like, I want a sandwich. That's dickish behavior. A hero sandwich. And no, it's not. He went to a place to get lunch. And then they offer this big football player a Greek salad and some quiche and tortellini, like a tortellini. These are weird choices to be like, like when you go to a restaurant or any kind of food place, they they can recommend stuff to you, but you shouldn't be beholden to those things. Of course not. But he could have been less like, I want this. I want a sandwich. Make me a sandwich. And then she's like, oh, if you need that sandwich, you're a hero of mine. And then, like a second after that, when when would he have this? Oh, uh, yeah. So Natalie goes, "That was good." When Tootie says, "You'd make a hero out of any sandwich you ate," I personally don't think it was good. But Natalie, I get why Natalie thought it was good. I do think her next one is good, and that one even impresses Blair. But we'll get to that one in a second. Um, Jeff introduces himself to Tootie and she's like, oh, I know all about you. Like, really throwing herself at him. And she says he's on the football team. She's like, I hear you are the football team. And that's where Blair is like, bam! Mm -hmm. That's how you do it. I'm going to use that one. I wrote down, at this point, have people just forgotten the meaning of words? Um, I thought that one made sense. Bladdily are impressed with it. And Tootie's not even remotely shy around him or shy about doing this in front of her friends. I say, go Tootie, get that D. Loving it. Loving that energy. Uh, then Tootie suggestively pairs some roast beef with a baguette. Winks suggestively. 
offers him a sando on the house, and Joe is not happy about any of this. Wait, you genuinely saw roast beef in that sandwich? No, I just wanted to like put roast beef and a baguette together. No. Um, no, it seemed like it was cheese and mustard. It, that sandwich was white on white on yellow on white. It was, yeah. she, it was a giant baguette that she then hastily like cut open. She got like some slices that she smears. She, it's just, she, it's chaos. Then, and at this point she's like, you want the sandwich? And like, and he's like, it'll be on the house. And now Joe's like, are you kidding me with this shit? Uh, Natalie comes in with a giant piece of t toilet paper and is like, wrap it in this. And then they hand this chaos thing, white pieces of trash together. And he's just sort of like, Oh, yeah, this looks delicious. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm so excited. Uh, it was very weird. It was very intensely done. Um, it was, like, clear that they were like, oh, my God, this girl's going to have to make a sandwich on camera. We're going to have to, like, do this as fast as we can. Like, they clearly were trying to choreograph something, and it was just so poorly done. But, yes, I agree. And also, she cut, like, very wide, thick slices of what looked like Jarlsberg onto a baguette with mustard and nothing else. And then they're all like, that was so expensive. But it was like, that sandwich couldn't have been more than like two bucks. And and it was that you shouldn't even charge people for that sandwich. Tootie was right to give it away. Um Tootie shouldn't Tootie shouldn't be making anyone sandwiches ever again. Well not they really need to train her because they're just like also like she did it on like the outside of the counter. Like just everything felt like it was off protocol. It feels very unsafe. Like, um, yeah. this is just, Edna's, Edna's edibles at this point is just like, you know, um, a minefield of bacteria. Jeff introduces himself to Mrs. Garrett, compliments her on. And immediate, Mrs. Garrett immediately objectifies him. Well, in a second, but first he introduces himself and then compliments her on the fuckability of her wait staff. That's true. He does. Uh, which makes Tootie and me giggle. Uh, Mrs. Garrett hopes he'll be back if he likes the sandwich. And he's like, I'll be back even if it sucks, because I want to bang Tootie, if you know what I mean. And Mrs. Garrett's like, I know what you mean, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I did find that really funny. And then does he leave, and then Mrs. Garrett's like, when is he, who's this handsome man who's going to be on, this, on the front of a Wheaties box? Um, well, Jeff invites Tootie to his game the next night, mm -hmm. uh, asks her to be his date for the subsequent mm -hmm. victory party. Confidence oh. is very sexy. Um, but, uh, Mrs. Garrett's like, what do you mean victory? You haven't played yet. And he's like, I haven't fucked Tootie yet either, but some things are inevitable, Mrs. Garrett. Mm -hmm. She's like, that's fair. Um, then he calls Tootie excellent one more time. Yeah. Uh, and she giggles. He leaves. Natalie swarms her, super impressed that she's already so young and yet so good at fly fishing. Uh, and Blair, also very impressed. A yeah. little girl has trapped her first man, which is a pretty spectacular thing to say. And then Joe's like, and she only used five bucks of cheese. Five bucks? No. Yeah, no. No way. Um, then Mrs. Garrett startles herself. She, Five cents. She, maybe. I mean, I don't know. That could be very, very imported Jarlsberg. Like, you could be sent from one side of the country and then back, like, six or seven times. So just the airfare. Okay, so it's just the airfare. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't, I don't know how cheese works. But Mrs. Garrett freaks herself out when she calls Jeff a nice young hunk. It's like... Yes. Oh, am I a pedophile? Yeah, I um, literally wrote down... Mrs. Garrett, he's a minor. Yeah, seems problematic. We They actually acknowledge that he's not 18 yet in this episode. Don't call him a hunk. Yes. And then uh, Tootie remains composed for a full 12 seconds until Natalie asks her what she has to say, and she monologues herself into hysteria, ending with, and he's all mine. <laughs> the two celebrate. But again, do we know that? I mean, he seems pretty uh committed he invited her to a to a to watch him play football and then go to a party afterward i don't know if that's all hers yet 
Yeah, she's jumping the gun, but as somebody who's seen season nine, episode 20, okay. I, know, I happen to know. Uh, but yes, yes, it is not um, It is not a done deal. She's counting her chickens before she gets laid. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're in the living room, and Tootie is dressed like that, uh, that my buddy and me. Kid yeah. sister. She's kid sister. Kid sister, kid sister. Wherever I go, she goes. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, that is so, right. <laughs> but uh, so I do have a sort of to a small tangent about those dolls. I believe that those were a an effort in the eighties to give little boys dolls to normalize having little kid boys have. Uh, you know, my buddy was, but kid yeah. sister was his kid sister, and yeah, he, obviously she was for girls. Yeah, no, no, but boys yes. weren't allowed to have those. No, why would they? They would turn out gay. Yeah, that's disgusting. Um, but what I mean is that's that not I, disgusting. It's just, but not it's just, ideal. it was just such a strange, you know, like cash grab for in the eighties, being like, you know what, little boys probably want dolls. They want to hang out with a silent, squishy thing that smiles at them, and you can just they make them wave and take their clothes off and brush their hair. You know, like yeah, that's something that little boys will totally want. It's just such a strange thing that uh, that has stuck in my mind since I saw those commercials when I was a kid. But well, I wasn't. I mean, isn't that what girls want? I wasn't a big doll person, so. I I was I like stuffed animals. I was more of a stuffed animal type person, but yeah. you know. Um, so uh, in the living room, um, Natalie is regaled with tales of their date. Yeah, because about how they didn't speak for ten minutes stretches. Yeah, they, they because they were just gazing at one another. Mm-hmm. Wordlessly. Um, Natalie's like, "Wow, I don't think I've ever gone ten minutes without talking." Um, Tootie talks about how she's uh, hey, he's going to be a sports star. And she's going to be a star star. Why not movie star? Um, and then we'll have uh, shared ulcers or something. No, it's because the reason why she's going to be a star star is that she's going to be, you know, a triple threat. She's going to be like a J-Lo. She's going to be a dancer. She's going to be a singer. She's going to be an actor. You know? I don't know why, but when you said J-Lo, I envisioned Jay Leno. And I was like, why Jay Leno? Oh, she said J-Lo. <laughs> but like... Uh Th those names are close. It's true. I mean, Jay, Jay Leno is a triple threat, you know, um, but he it's can like. Drive. He can drive. He can wear a lot of denim. And he can host The Tonight Show. Yeah. And All right. Just, That's three things. Yeah. But in any um, case, I think it's just that it's a way to make a sort of joke happen for Tootie. A star star. Yeah. Um, so they're going to be like Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn Monroe, but black. Yeah, so then she lists, so they so they list three different couples. So they so first she's like, we can be like Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn Monroe. And it's like, Tootie, I don't know if you know what you're saying. Because yeah, they were only married for nine months. And he broke up with her because he was grossed out by the subway grade scene in Seven Year Itch, apparently. So so they they had an extremely torrid love affair. Like they Those he the best kind. Well, of course, no, I want a very boring, you know, flaccid love affair. He, I believe at Those the time, had, yeah, had had uh, retired from the Yankees. He's, and, you know, as uh, people who listen to the facts of facts may not know this, <laughs> but um, widely regarded as, like, the best baseball player in, uh, you know, even now. Like, better than Babe Ruth. Like, he spent his entire career with the Yankees. He was just, like, a consummate sportsman, just really amazing, best whatever. Best baseball player, worst teeth. The teeth, yeah. So he looks, he's not a very attractive man. Let's just say that. But. His name is so elegant. Yeah. He was, I think he was one of nine. He was born in San Francisco to like a fisherman. I think, yeah, I mean, DiMaggio, Italian fisherman. That makes sense. There are a lot of Italian uh, immigrants in San Francisco. Um, but he was, he was regarded as a ball player as like just one of those, just the preternaturally gifted person who was incredibly good at everything. He could field, he could score. <laughs> sort of like how you are with podcasting. Exactly. Yeah, I'm a triple threat. I can wear jeans, I know how to drive, and I can and host a the bun. And a bun. Um, 
But anyway, so he, I think he retired and then like he had a crush on her and like asked someone because he was extremely famous. He knew everyone, you know, and so did she because she had supposedly had an affair with, you know, the Kennedys and Sinatra and you know, she, you know, she got around. Anyway, um, so he's like, let's go out on a date. And um, they go out on a date. And she was very much like kind of surprised because she was like, we're so much alike. Like, we're both sort of quiet and retiring. We've got a good sense of humor. And she was like, he didn't like come on to me in a gross way. Like, he really like was, he, he thought she was incredibly smart. And she, they got along, they had great chemistry. They got married pretty quickly. And they were only married for nine months because he was abusive and incredibly jealous. Like, really, really, really jealous. Like, and also was like, wanted to stay at home wife um, and wanted to have probably, like, you know, family with her. And she, this was like, kind of when she was taking off. Like, I, then she did the 100 year itch. And like, that was when, the seven year itch? There we go, sorry. 100 years of solitude, <laughs> seven year itch. Um, that, um, that, and she was over standing over the, the, the subway grate and he was like, I can't believe that all of the world has seen my wife's thighs and even her underwear. And she was like, uh, my bad. I mean, hadn't they all seen her boobies already? No. Oh, she waited to drop the boobies? Well, I think that the boobies were a little, were, well, I think the boobies were kind of, she did those early, those early nudie shoots when she was still Norma Jean, but I'm not sure that those had really kind of gotten to the like mainstream yet in terms of being like, oh, those are Marilyn Monroe's titties. I don't not, but again, this is not something that I did, that I did a lot of research into, but, um, so they get divorced. Um, and, um, she gets remarried. She marries Arthur Miller. They have a very bad marriage as well. Um, but he never really fell out of love with her. Um, and even when, I think she had to be kind of like, she, uh, I think after the Arthur Miller marriage crumbling, then she was really like having a, like a bad time. She was depressed, she was an addict. Um, he like basically like got her out of like the mental institution, like took care of her in Florida where he was then living as a baseball coach. And so like, and then once she, you know, overdosed in I think 62, um, he sent, um, roses to her grave three times a week for like the rest of his life. So he was incredibly devoted, but I think I'm sort of like, you know, Tootie and like, maybe not invoke. I agree. This is not the right, this is not the one. A much better example would be, and far more notable. <laughs> yes. Would be Alex Karras and Susan Clark. So this is the one where I was like, who the fuck are these people? They're Webster's parents. Of course. And that's the greatest thing is that I was like, I was, of course. Such a, it's such a large jump from Marilyn Monroe and Joe DiMaggio to Webster's parents. Like, I don't even know what to do with myself. So Alex Karras was a former football player. He played yes. for the- It makes a lot more sense. But it's, it requires so much like unpacking because I suppose Webster, was Webster on the air in 1983? Okay, Webster had been on the air for two weeks when this episode aired. So that's, in, that's in, and see, that's the thing. The, the, so, it, so then the, the reason that this was written into this episode is that Susan, so Alex On Karras, a rival network, I should say. Yeah, that's also important. So Alex Karras was a football player for the Detroit Tigers, who then transitioned Lions. into Lions. Really? Yeah. I thought, anyway. Um, anyway, he was sort of widely regarded as a very funny man. Like he had a really good sense of humor. Um, and um, so he like transitioned into um, acting and he did a lot of like funny, weird little like cameo things. Um, but he starred in the, a movie with his now with his wife Susan Clark, with this who was a famous actress, who played um, the sports the incredible sports star um, Babe Zacharias, who was a like an incredibly famous. She was at that point regarded as like 
she won like more Olympic medals than any American woman than had any before. Other talking pig. <laughs> yes, um, but so, um, but she was one of those people that like she competed in the 1932 Olympics and was one of those like weird talents where like she was good at running, javelin, jumping, golf, but also bowling, billiards, also great at vaudeville. So like she was this, this is this weird person that Susan Clark then portrayed in an Emmy, in an Emmy, which won her an Emmy with Alex Karras. So this is such a long walk for this to make any sense for any person. Uh, yeah, she also posed topless in Playboy in 73. Um, and uh, they also filmed Porky's together in 1980. Yep, he was where in Porky's. she was the prostitute Cherry Forever. Yeah. Um, they, they ended up doing quite a few things together, but I think their most notable one was Webster. Which is such a weird thing to include on a, it's like, on a rival network. It's just everything. I mean, maybe they were just in the news. It was like husband and wife team pair up for the sitcom of the century. You like different strokes? You'll love Webster. <laughs> the only thing that I remember about Webster is that they is that Webster he were, he mostly travels on the sh show through the dumb waiter. Okay. Um, Joe Namath is and another one. Like Natalie's like. She she kind of comes in for the for, for the third the third joke you know three times you, you have to have three in a row right oh, that's and she's true. which is or Joe Namath and everyone else just slut shaming Joe Namath really cool guys but Thank also you. but also so then Tootie is the everybody else that Joe Namath is slutting around with all the famous everybody else. <laughs> Um, yeah, I jokes, was, the joke I stopped working. It should have just been Alex Karras and Susan Clark, and then they should have been like, did you hear about that new show, Webster? <laughs> uh, I would have laughed harder. Um, Joe Namath famously told the world that he fucked 300 girls at college. Which is a, something that to keep in mind to on a show to bring up for a show for little girls in 1983. Exactly. Um, I once was in very close quarters with Joe Namath. I did was. He, did he slip it in? He might have. It was hard to tell. Uh, no, I was getting. I was moving past him on an airplane. Um, he was in first class, and I was in, you know, steerage or whatever. But he is still very handsome. Um, I was going from, I think, New York to LA or LA to New York, and he looks great. You know, he's probably like almost eighty now, and he still looks, you know, high and tight. So you would fuck him. I would have fucked him. But, as long as you should have let him know. I bet he would have done it. But the thing is, is that he also he was um he was wearing full a full gray sweatsuit. Like one that you would get at like Kmart. Like he was it was so nondescript, but I mean you're flying, you want to be comfortable. For sure. No, but it was that you is that even him wearing like sort of the equivalent of like what they would give you if you had to go to prison. He still was, he still was, was joking. stunning. Yeah, he was. He was smiling and flirty, and it was sort of like, yeah, I, I am. I'm Joe. You know, he was like, and I was like, yeah, wow, damn. So. I'm the kind of person that would not notice an 80-year-old Joe Namath on his flight. Somebody would have to be like, that's Joe Namath. And I would probably look at the wrong person and be like, cool. <laughs> I also, I also the my other two really good um, sightings on an airplane. One was um, uh, uh, Jackson Galaxy, the Cat Whisperer. That guy. Mm hmm. Great facial hair. Yeah, he that guy you totally would recognize. I would. Because <laughs> he's got the glasses, he's got the sleeve tats, he's got interesting hair, you know. And uh, the other one, I, who I also think you might recognize, Buster Rhymes. 50-50 on that one. Okay. Buster Rhymes, here's the thing. Buster Rhymes is also incredibly tall. And, like, a, he looks like he's a big man. So I would recognize Buster Rhymes if it was the era of his music videos. I would recognize him 
if he was performing or it was playing. But seeing Buster Rhymes present day, I can't say I would be like, there he is. <laughs> Uh, okay. But I don't know. Maybe I could. Maybe he, time has cha- has not changed anything for him. I do not know. But I imagine time might have. Um, I guess you'd be the judge. Did time change Busta Rhymes? He looked, he looked older. Um, he looked a little, I would say, broader, but not bad. All right. Good. Good. Um, somebody who does look bad is Cousin Jerry, who walks in with a turtleneck that looks like a diseased foreskin. Yeah. It's bad news. I mean, her boobs look great, but yeah. the the neck is freaking me out. It's like a Venus flytrap is in the middle of chomping her. Yeah, it looks like it's going to swallow her skull. Very, very, like, I don't think I've ever been so upset by a turtleneck. But anyway, she's upset too. Not because of the turtleneck, but because yeah. she does not want to do this gig. That Blair books for her. Apparently, she'd have to be the opening act for a rock band, an anonymous rock band. Rock bands hate cerebral palsy jokes. I that can't be true. <laughs> I, I, uh, Jerry's plot is to bitch and moan about nothing. Yeah. All episode. Yeah. Uh, Jerry worries that they're going to kill her. The audience will kill her. She says. Um, and Blair's like, maybe, literally says maybe, but what am I supposed to say to the entertainment committee? I know. And the thing is, is that it's like, how, how important is this entertainment committee at Langley? Like, yeah. is, this, is this the entertainment committee at Langley where you go to school at the FBI? You know, like, is that the entertainment committee where they could, they might actually make you disappear? Like, it, she's acting as though they will have her off if she does not succeed with this opening act. Also, nobody cares about an opening act, especially when it's Cousin Jerry. I So um, there was a little trend, I would say, in the last 10 years where there were a lot of stand-ups who were opening for bands. I remember Patton Oswalt opening up for Amy Mann and Michael Penn. Okay. I saw Amy Schumer open up for Madonna. Okay. Ah, but it was Mine's sort of cooler. Okay, um, I mean, I do like Pat Oswalt, but I the thing I is, you like Michael Penn. <laughs> I like Amy Mann. I love uh, Amy Mann, but Michael Penn has never made a bad song. Genius songwriter. Anyway, I think that it it is a way for um, the the musicians who are touring to associate themselves with cool people who laugh who make their you know audience members laugh but also it's a reason for and so those comics can then you know bring in a little paycheck to be like i just opened for madonna you know um but also it's so that the true fans of the mu- musical act they don't have to come in until the music is starting it's like i'm not gonna get here two hours early to watch some person tell jokes for 15 minutes I'm going to go outside, you know, get some drinks. And when the crowd roars, I'm going to go in and see the people that I paid to see. Sure. Um, Blair does not want to own up to her mistake to the, you know, scary entertainment committee. Jerry, however, is happy to do it for her, which somehow constitutes as a joke. And then they leave through a door that I've never seen before, which actually shows like foliage. It is a third door in the living room that goes to the outside. Yeah. That's crazy. They'll never, we'll never see that door again. I almost guarantee it. I was gobsmacked by it, but I've said this before. At this point, I don't trust you about yeah. this door situation. because There's so many this, doors in this room. You say this every week. You say, I've never seen that door before. I've never seen that door before. What door did they leave out of? And I'm like, I don't know. I've never seen this show before. So when there was a new door, I just assumed that that's, that's been there forever. Well, so now we've seen people, it's been five, four episodes, if you count the first one as a two-parter, um, in this, with this living room, and people have entered through three different do- front doors, and then there's <laughs> also three different ways to exit the room where you can go through the store, to the back where the kitchen is, or up the stairs. This is, like, the perfect room for, like, a clapping doors kind of farce situation, um, I don't think they ever really fulfill its potential, but I love this set. A, a clapping doors? Isn't it? Flapping doors? Clapping, slapping? 
clapping? Slamming. There you go. Slamming. No, it's it's like the clap. No, it's a slamming doors comedy. <laughs> I'm gonna Google this. <laughs> clapping doors. <laughs> Let's see. Nope, not a thing. Okay. <laughs> oh, not believing me, but it's nice to feel indicated. Anyway, um, so so Joe and Mrs. and Mrs. Garrett enter from upstairs. That is correct. Um, and 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 Mrs. Garrett's like, so Joe is going to take me over to my girlfriend, Mrs. Sylvia's house. Just Sylvia, not Mrs. Sylvia. <laughs> Whatever. And she's, she's the fortune teller. And she she's lives like, in the bayou. And then she's going to take my car to the garage so that I can have my pistons rotated. And Joe's just like, yeah, whatever, close enough. I need to get out of the scene. I mean, it sounds like a fun day for Joe to get to rotate Mrs. Garrett's pistons. Meet <laughs> Sylvia, the famous Sylvia we hear so much about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Joe yells at Tootie. For not getting the inventory done. Apparently, it's been three days, but Natalie points out she's been busy making Kodak moments and, best of all, sharing them. So, which tells me that Natalie has gotten to see some photographs of Jeff's penis. Yeah. That is that not what was implied? Because that's definitely what I got. I imagine that it's first of all partly the 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 way that the facts of life likes to drop in um, catchphrases from products even though they're not actually product placement, it's just a way for the audience to go, oh yeah, no, that's right, it is. You need to share the memories. That's from Kodak. That's right, okay, I know recognize oh, yeah, that. Oh yeah, they did another slogan. Yeah, oh yeah. Cool. Yeah. But also, um, Tootie. there's continuity there because Tootie was the one who went to Langley with her goddamn camera and made Natalie stand in front of the coffee machine just so that she could get a nice picture of it. Yeah, Natalie. Tootie loves her pictures. Um, Tootie's been shirking her responsibilities. Apparently, she owes Edna's edible 6.2 hours of work, which is a weird business model. It's like, put in six random hours and we're good? Like, she's prepaid? I'm confused how this works. I mean, I imagine, so, well, typically if you do, it shouldn't be 6.2, it should be like six and a quarter, because I do think that if you're paid by the hour, you can put in quarters for you know like you work 15 minutes rather than the full half an hour or the full 45 minutes or the full hour so but again it's just a joke so that mrs so that joe looks like she's being a real stickler and then mrs garrett's like i'd be happy with the just the sex yes. and then joe's like then joe i don't know business explains to mrs garrett saying you know you know, Tudios, Edna's Edibles, 6.2 hours of work, two minutes a year, a free sandwich there, it adds up. Mrs. Garrett's like, you're a hard ass. I'm glad I don't work for you. Yeah. And then we're out of that scene. It was a weak blow. Yeah. But uh, but we had to get to the meat of the episode, which is later that day, Jeff helping Tootie do inventory. Yes. Um, he's trying to get her to hurry the fuck up so she can get uh, fingered in between Jaws 1 and Jaws 2 during their very romantic double feature. Yes. He's very open about his feelings for Tootie. He is, which I like. I like that too. I said I think it's good for her. Yeah. Um, he says he wants to bury her head in his chest. She eats this up, but then jokes that she's going to puke on his pecs. Because I guess the shark carnage. Yeah. Um, Jeff says the coach has been making him work all week and Sunday should be his day of rest, which is not really how it works for most football players, but okay. Um, Tootie <laughs> says that only God gets to rest on Sundays because he was busy making the world for the first six, but that's like one week. So there's a lot of Sundays that I think God can work. I don't know. I didn't know what she was talking yeah, about there. It's, it's again, the, the thing about this episode is that it has this odd, like as I said earlier, quality where it's like the guy, the guy writing it doesn't truly understand how words work. Like it's like, or these, this sentence doesn't really, it's like, well, now I get Sunday off, you know, because, and it's like, well, God didn't, I mean, and it's like, but 
the only thing that football is really associated with is it's Sunday. Sundays. Yes. Uh, I, I just felt like, I um, yeah, uh, I felt like, a lot of times he was like filling in the blanks with like blah bitty, blah bitty, blah just yeah. to get to Tootie freaking out about the reading thing. Um, but anyway, she asked him to read all the labels from the jars so he, he uh, she can write how many they have. The fam store is so small and they have access to it 24 seven. They live there. Why is this being done in the middle of the work day? Just when you close the shop, uh, you've had your dinner, just you got another hour until you know, Webster comes on your favorite show. You know, just go count the mustard jars. Leave your boyfriend out of it. It doesn't seem, and it's it's not, this is also kind of like a not a two-person job. Like, At all. it can go faster if you do this by yourself. Let him just sit there and not read and talk to you if you want him around. Yeah, he's making every excuse not to do inventory. But then she's just like, how many jars of mustard do we have? And he glances at three jars. And then turns back immediately and goes, 24. Well, at this point, I was sort of like, well, maybe he's just, maybe like he's like he's not good at reading, but maybe he's sort of like Rain Man. And then it's just like he like looked at it and he was like, I know there's 24 there. It was weirder and faster than the sandwich. Um, <laughs> she needs to know how many mustard variants there are. Yes. Um, one of them I said was lemon mustard, which sounds so nice. I'm going to either make it or buy it in the short future. What would go good with lemon mustard? Um, I think you could make a croque monsieur with that. Oh, that sounds lovely, actually. Yeah. Okay, done. Done. Um, no more recipes. Uh, you, she asks uh, how many horse... What? You could also put it on um, a sort of like a mustardy, lemony glaze and roast some salmon with it. Did I not just say no more recipes? Sorry. Don't, Was that don't confuse my palate. Then I'm going to have to make both. Sorry. Um, what if I bring up what if I bring up this movie hot dog that Tootie's like, forget the movie hot dog. Yeah, I actually just I skipped the movie hot dog. <laughs> um yeah, so uh she asks how many horseradish mustards they have, and he's not sure they all look the same, and she screams at him, Can't you read? And he turns around and looks dumbfounded. Finally admits, well, reading's not my thing, okay? I mean, you know. It's two different things. Reading cannot be your thing, or you cannot know how to read. Just saying. Um, Tootie doesn't understand how this happened, and she will say this many times, and then everybody else who meets, who finds out about this story will say the same thing. His excuse, apparently, is that his coach said he can't get distracted by words. Yeah, he's like, so do, I, he said, coach doesn't want me to get distracted, you know, football is my thing, and and he's like, you know, but, and reading isn't, but like, you know, it's, I don't walk in through the exit and I don't sit on wet paint and I've never used the ladies room. And it's like, so you don't really need to be able to read to do any of those things. Because first of all, clearly that's what, that's what Jeff is proving. Ladies rooms have especially in 1983, a woman in a dress, the icon of a woman in a dress on it. So he's like, oh, that's not, that's not the one for the men. You know, if it's wet paint, well, there's- Mexican a restaurants might have like a pink sombrero on the door. And I feel like, you know, it's not like, it's not like, you know, uh, Jeff hasn't told us that he's colorblind. So, you he's know. He's mustard blind. <laughs> he is mustard blind. Um, you know, but then it's like, it also if there's like a bench, if there's a bench, right, that With has a, a sign on it, <laughs> you shouldn't sit on it. And if there's the one that's like over the, the the big red and white sign over the over one of the doors, and people are coming out of it, you know not to go in it. So he's just like he's using the code of you know being able he can he can flourish as best he can. He just can't read. That is. Fairly true. Um, he uh, She makes him read a jar of hollandaise sauce, which he thinks is horseradish mustard, which would have been such a gimme from Tootie. But also, he knew where the horseradish mustard was kept. So it's like he kind of can't even read context clues. 
True. But he does slam that jar down of the Hollandaise very violently. Yeah. Obviously. Does not like the Hollandaise. Now, is- I, I don't blame him. I don't like Hollandaise sauce either. I do. I am not a huge fan of creamy sauces. Fair enough. I understand. Um, um, anyway, no, but this- they're man made. Yes. Um, Sorry. Otherwise, I- <laughs> my Hollandaise is always woman made because I make it myself. Ooh. I don't. I don't do that. Hey, that store bought Edna's edibles bullshit. Yeah, I would never think a jar of hollandaise sauce could be good, but I who knows? I, I'm not a hollandaise person. Uh, Tootie still doesn't get how this happened, but Jeff explains that everybody just helps him cheat, memorizing test answers before the test, and no one says anything to him because he is the football team, so he's got a chance to be the best quarterback in the whole country. Just as long as nobody tries to get him to read. Yeah. And then Jeff shows how he's able to get everybody to cheat for him. It's his effortless charm. He tells Tootie he doesn't want his girl walking around like she's been eating sour lemons. And all of a sudden, Tootie's like, your girl? Mm -hmm. Fuck reading comprehension. I'm in. Yeah. Well, the other thing is that that I I just need to reiterate in this scene that... We go from Tootie having um, the little clipboard of the mustard inventory that she desperately needs to get through. And she's like, we need to do this before the double feature. Like, we, th- we, we got to, we're not going to get that movie hot dog unless we get going, right? And he's like, I just want to not do this. And then as soon as the whole revelation happens where the not being able to read thing, she's like, wait, you can't read? And he's like, well, I mean, I, it's not like I can't survive i you know coach i it's fine she's like whoa whoa, whoa, whoa. wait a minute you can't read and then he's like listen no and then she's like what does this say what does this say and like it kept keeps hammering him about it until he gets upset and frustrated enough about it and slams it down and then she's like well but don't you want to read and it's like you know, Tootie, you're, you're not the issue. Like, this is ridiculous. Like, you need, if you want to help someone learn how to read, be like Madonna in A League of Their Own, where she's teaching the woman who doesn't know how to read on the back of the bus, and she's teaching her very carefully to read this lovely romance novel. And... There she is. She's sounding out. She's like, mil, mil, milky, milky, milky white, milky white bre- breasts. And then one of the, the, the other women on the team turns around and goes, May, what are you teaching her? And then Madonna goes, shut up. At least she's reading. Tootie could have been Madonna to Jeff. She could have been, shut up. At least he's reading. Speaking of... A little Speaking of Madonna, do you have another thing to say about Madonna this episode? No, I, I recently rewatched A League of Their Own because it's one of my favorite movies ever made. And it's it just great. It's just incredibly uh you saw know. It in the theater. I think I did too. It was a summer movie. Yeah. Um uh is um I noticed that so when they all have to arrive in Chicago for tryouts, Madonna comes with her best friend, played by Rosie O'Donnell. And Madonna is in her um, her baseball uh, uniform from her hometown team, which is Peekskill. So she has a connection with our girls. She's like their ancestor. Yes. Um, All the way. <laughs> uh, so um, he sings a line of my girl to her. Yeah. And Tootie's all in now. Uh, he gives her his necklace. And uh, Tootie has so many emotions that Kim Fields is playing this like she has to vomit. She's yeah. Like, like vomit right on his pecs, just like, like she promised. Um, and we don't get applause at this act out, which we always do. But this commercial break we go into, it's like this is serious stuff. Unlike when Sue Ann passed out from her eating disorder, which was totally applause worthy, this is like, Tootie's going to date a guy who doesn't know how to read? Mm-mm. 
the vibe was totally off. And uh, yeah, and we're uh, out. It was a fat act one, not on our part. I actually think we did a pretty good job of covering it. But normally they end at like 11 minutes. This one ended at almost 15. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and the, the, which I think is such an odd choice because, um, first of all, if we thought about the Cousin Jerry stuff, we could have had a little bit more of a um, focused episode about Jeff and Tootie and just the, the... You want there to be B-plots? You don't want there to be B-plots. Yeah, but Cousin Jerry is barely a B-plot. I mean, that's what kind of is like the joy for me. Anyway, so... But I, I, I will say, though, that as we move into this second act, is that this doesn't go where I thought it was going to go. So this is one that I remember very, very vividly. So what did you think? So I like, like all the pieces just have to go into the place that I imagine. But where did you think it was going to go? I thought this was going to be a... Um, you know, uh, it was Judy was going to be teaching Jeff, her Helen Keller, how to read. You know, I thought it was oh, going to, not cheating for him, not cheating for him, because that somehow at this point makes it all about Tootie and Tootie's transgression. Because then later, Natalie and Mrs. Garrett are like, Tootie, I can't believe you. And it's like, we well, could we need everybody to be mad at Jeff for not being able to read, just like get five of them, six if you can't, Jerry. All just being like, what? You can't read? How? No. What? It would, it would just have a better trajectory in terms of sat the sat a satisfying trajectory that would have Tootie doing something kind and nice where he actually then learns to read in the second half rather than the last bit of it, of this episode, is him being, is both of them kind of being like, confronting the fact that she knows his secret and she still likes him. So you would rather that the writers say, learning how to read uh, for an 18 year old is so easy, you could do it in the second half of an act that we cut short because we did 14 minutes in the first act. Not so much, but more like, the, the, more like you know, maybe like they have a big blow up right now and then they get, they kind of get back together and then Tootie's like, you, and he's like, you know, I told my, my coach that I do need to focus more on my studies because of X, Y, and Z. And no. so would you help? No, no, no. Um, so now, no, instead, so you did, so what you're saying is that you did not anticipate that Mrs. Garrett would be throwing all the girls a congratulations on finishing the inventory party complete with a punch bowl. You didn't see that coming? I didn't see that coming. And to be perfectly frank, I, when, I, when we first opened on it, I was like, is this the freshman night party? <laughs> this lame sauce thing with just these like four girls, a punch bowl of brown liquid and a bowl of apples and grapes. It was a weird spread, a really fruity and weird spread. And it's like, it's like, you know what guys, just go through the door this way and go get a sandwich and some of that old day old quiche and party with that because that's gonna go bad. Quiche is terrific. I've heard great things. <laughs> um, but no, uh, it's so weird. I loved it. I really like, I just saw the punch bowl and then I was like, congratulations on finishing the inventory. And I snorted. Like I was probably my biggest laugh of the episode. Um, they cheers to the end of inventory and then Blair says they should appreciate that they're not McDonald's. Because 45 billion sold, someone had to count every one of them. Nobody knows how inventory works in this group. As I said. They all have different interpretations of it. But, and also, you don't know how words work, do you? That is pretty clear. Um, there's a knock on one of the many doors. And it's Cousin Jerry, who's looking way less chesty than she did in her first scene. But at least she doesn't have that turtleneck. So... Up actually a rather cute outfit. I thought she looked really nice. Like the jeans were tight. She was wearing a like a white and red sort of plaid top that was like tied very sexily around like her, where her navel is. Like it was yeah, a very I, sexy. I thought she looked cute. Um, yeah. I also am like, okay, like I thought maybe there was like some kind of weird neck deformity that she didn't want to show us. But I was like, there's the neck. What is the reason for the turtlenecks? I don't get it. I don't get it. It's such a bad turtleneck. But I guess maybe that's like your signature, like Paula Poundstone. What did she have? She had ties. Yeah. Yeah. This was her tie. It was a turtleneck. 
something around this area for female comedians in the 80s. Um, there's, uh, so uh, it is Jerry, and uh, Jerry laments she wishes she was anywhere else this weekend because as Blair boasts, Jerry has agreed to humiliate herself for Blair's freshman night thing. Yeah. She's broke. That's why she's doing it. I'm, yeah. I'm not clear on what level of success Cousin Jerry had versus Jerry Jewel in terms of comedy. Because it seems like maybe not as good as I thought. Um, Blair forgot to tell Jerry there's great news. Though. Yeah, because so, so she's like basically, Cousin Jerry comes in whining about the fact that she's going to, you know, how she has to open to this fucking like rock band. And then Blair's like, oh, no, they canceled. Days I, ago. Why are you going to throw what? that in? Like, what's going on, Blair? Like, you, you got your cousin this, you know, you're, you're basically asking her to do a favor for you. And you don't even tell her that she's not opening for a rock band anymore. She's opening for Robert Klein. Okay, so when this rock band uh, canceled, do you think that the entertainment committee disappeared, whoever booked that rock band? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and so that's the other thing is that she's like, so then she's like, no, 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 it's fine. I fixed everything. I booked Robert Klein, which again, weird choice for a group of 17 and 18 year olds in 1983 peak skill to, for like Robert Klein to come up do, to come up and do like a tight 60 minute set for teenagers. I mean, I think that's awesome. That's that I could see like, you know, college kids liking Robert Klein at that era. What I don't understand is how Cousin Jerry was like, oh no, not Robert Klein, the comedian. You want me to open up for a comedian? What do you, who do you want to open up for, Jerry? If it's not an, a, a rock band and it is not a, another comedian, what is it? Do you want to open up for a symphony? What is it that you want? Because your bank balance is very low, apparently. And so maybe you're being too picky with. What gigs you're accepting and not accepting? Because honestly, both seem like great gigs for you. Exactly. And that's the thing is that, first of all, Robert Klein is regarded as like a very, especially in 83, really like a seminal comic. Like he's a, an important person, you know? Um, and so Evan's this is- made from semen, right? Yes. Okay. And, but, and it's- um, um, uh, this is her job to open for other more well-established comics. And, you know, what, wasn't the last time we saw Cousin Jerry, wasn't she opening up at like the Ho the Howard Johnson on like Route 9 and Peekskill on like a Thursday at four in the afternoon? Yeah, she did like a fucking set in the cafeteria once. Her I career, mean, this is great for her career. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk a little about Robert Klein. Go for it. So um, he uh, was born in the Bronx. Um, and oh, like Joe and you. Like Joe and me. Um, and um, uh, was um, very famous. Uh, so it, um, he wanted to be, I think, a, a doctor, but then he decided that he wanted to be a, a he went to Yale drama, he decided he wanted to be in, a, an actor. Um, he was on Broadway a lot, but he recorded um, a an album, which I'm going to get wrong. I think it's something like Growing Up in the 50s or Coming Up in the 50s or something like that. It was a very like, <clears throat> I wouldn't say um, uh, uh, safe or um, clean comic, but like comedy. But at the time, I think he was, because it was like, he's a Jewish guy, grew up in a very Jewish family, Jewish enclave. But like, it was very much about like, being speaking like honesty about like you know growing up on the block and having these interpersonal relationships and like, like it was like J Lo but comedy exactly like J Lo, um but so that's, but, that's J Lo I mean yeah. yes but it was regarded this album was regarded as like basically like um the rock critic um Christgau, Robert Christgau, Richard Christgau, Robert Christgau. Christgau. what Christgau Christgau yeah. So he wrote, he, he wrote, he compared um, Robert Klein to uh, Richard Pryor and Lily Tom Tomlin. Like he was, he put like them in. Like a hybrid of the two? 
Yes, I approve the two. No, but more like they they spoke such honest comedy that, but that was not cynical and sort of yelling like a sort of like as opposed like or like George Carlin, I think. Oh. You know, um, but in any case, Robert Klein, um, you know, became um, he played these like slightly grouchy. I think a lot of people of our generation would know him as a sort of like slightly grouchy, but extremely well-meaning dads in movies. Like he plays um, Sandra Bullock's dad in Two Weeks Notice. Um, he, played, he played the mayor of New York in two of the Sharknado movies. Oh, ooh, oh my yeah. But here's the most important thing about him, which is why you're gonna care. He plays Deborah Messing's father on the reboot of Well and Grace, but also the mysteries of Laura. Ooh. Yeah. I knew that he was her dad on Mysteries of Laura. And was he was he not her dad in the original Will and Grace? In the original, it was, he was it was played by Alan Arkin. Oh, interesting. Anyway. I'll take it. Yeah. That is uh, any reference to the mysteries of Laura makes me very happy. Um, uh, when we're at this time of year, the beginning of the uh, TV season, yeah. uh, my Facebook memories all fill up with mysteries of Laura videos that I took and pictures of mysteries of Laura that I tagged you in. Yeah, I know. Every so, day I wake up and I, it's like, would you like to share this memory that Dominic tagged you in from 10 years ago? And I go, no, I don't want to share this. Mysteries of Laura is one of the funniest things that's ever happened to television, and you should all seek it out. It's great. The concept is this. She's a cop, and she's a mother. Can't, can't, can't be both. She can, and that's what makes the show so watchable. Watch it. There's also, um, there's a, I have just recently, like I think yesterday, uh, my Facebook came up with a clip from Mysteries of Laura where it was this cancer patient. She had like the head wrap and she was, you know, the eye makeup to look very dark. And I think she was in a chair with like the chemo drip, something like that. And she's a witness to a crime. And the Mysteries of Laura asks her, she's like, hey, where were you during this period of time? And the cancer patient goes, uh, I was in the theater watching Pitch Perfect 2 which was worse than cancer. Wow. <laughs> and they put that on the show. They put that on television. Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, I preserved that clip because it's still, I think about it all the time, like, how did this, how does this exist? Anyway, watch The Mysteries of Laura because it's filled with stuff like that. Um, uh, Jeff, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Jerry, rather. Uh, asks if the punch bowl is big enough for her to drown in. And yes, it is. It's irrationally huge. If I were Blair, I'd help her test it out because she won't be happy until she gets the sweet release of death. Fair enough. And, and that's the thing is that I was just sort of, at this point, I was like, Jerry, why are you here? Because, you know, it's not like, it's like she's really just looking a gift horse in the mouth. You know, like this was a gig and it's a paying gig. I know that it was like your, your cousin hooked it up, but whatever. You know, it's not like she's headlining Caesar's Palace. No, this is a no, great case. She should do this. Robert Klein. <laughs> um, then, uh, let's see then what happens. Uh, Jeff arrives. Yes. Also excited to celebrate the end of inventory, which has probably, to be fair, been the hardest on him. Yeah, aside from the exam that he just had to pass. Yes, he's got some news. He passed his biology test, did better than expected. There's some eye contact between him and Tootie where he was like, don't make me look so smart or something. Um, tells me that Tootie has been uh, joining the team of Jeff helpers. Yes. Uh, if he passes English, then all the colleges are free to fight for him. Yeah. He is one English exam away from a free ride to college. And they will never acknowledge whether or not he decided to learn to read for that English exam or Tootie helped him that one last time so that they would have the buffer of time to help him learn how to read while he's getting ready for college. 
So I assume that because you said that he lasts until season nine? 19. Yes, nine. <laughs> um, uh, that he also goes to Langley. No, he goes away and then he'll be like a special visitor and stuff like that. Oh, it's Jeff's spring break or, oh, I just got back from vacation with Jeff or, oh, okay. Jeff surprised me in town. Something's going on. Mm, okay. Things like that. Um, but we never, <clears throat> hear, we never hear about the fact that he did or did not successfully get this football scholarship from any of these colleges, football colleges that want him. I really do believe that he goes away to the army or something, but I don't have the receipts. Okay. Um, Tootie looks miserable. Reluctantly joins everyone in toasting Jeff's success. She can't think of what to say. Suggests Nat the writer say something. And Nat whines about hate being put on the spot when you know she loves it. And then immediately comes up with the perfect toast. It rhymes and it ends with Jeff. He's not another dumb jock which makes yep. Tootie do her nauseous acting face again. And uh, Tootie storms into the store as Jerry grills Jeff about his college choices. Yep. That was the last we'll hear from Jerry. Thanks, God. Episode. Oh, did she come back for another episode? I think she's got a few more in the tank. Okay. Anyway, um, so, yeah. so Tootie storms off because she, she now knows what's up and knows, and she now is concealing a crime that she is now a part of. Yes, but she has decided to focus it on a bigger crime, which is the crime of the shuffled up plastic cutlery. Yeah. She, she comes furious about it. She runs into the the it is Edna's edibles and goes to this just shitty open basket on the corner of the counter and just starts like rifling with them. So it's this it's that horrible noise of plastic cutlery on one another squeaking. And she's just making that noise worse. And she's actually not sorting them out. She's making the problem worse and worse. Yes. And Mrs. Garrett is like, what the fuck? And Tootie's like, people got to stop fucking with these plastic spoons and fucking forks. And then Natalie comes in. And it's clear that by people, Tootie means Natalie. Because yeah. Tootie looks at Natalie and she's like, stop fucking with the forks, you bitch. Then they and pull each other's like, hair and wrestle on the floor. Mrs. Garrett pours olive oil and some hollandaise sauce on them. <laughs> That's like how the episode ends, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But Natalie's like, what the fuck is going on here? Didn't you like my speech? Of course, Natalie comes in asking for praise. Yeah. Well, uh, can we make this about me? It seems like yeah. you've got something going on that I don't know about. Yeah, so, so, so wait, hold on. And Natalie comes in and Mrs. Garrett, Mrs. Garrett's like, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm a little bit behind. So Natalie... You want to make this about you, not getting enough praise for your shitty little four-line four speech that you came up with in two seconds. So you want to make it about you. But also, so now, Tootie, walk me through your issue. Oh, you want to make this about you because now you're a part of the cheating issue. Yes. Well, they, gr they grill Tootie on what's up, and Natalie thinks it has to do with Jeff going to college because... Natalie sees everything through the prism of boy craziness and bedroom cake. And so yep. Natalie comforts Tootie, saying when he's at college, he'll write. And Tootie's like, no, he won't. And Natalie's like, he will if you write first and ask a lot of questions. And welcome to the Natalie School of Dating. No, but hold on. I will say this, that when, when um, Natalie says... Um, you're just, you're just worried he's not going to write you anything and, or anything, but he goes off to college. Judy has that look of like, yeah, he's not going to write. And I, yeah. that was my only laugh because it's Judy just being like, he never learned to read. He can't write. I, he, we, maybe we can speak on the phone, but no writing. And you can um, see him yeah. just being like, oh. Tootie says Jeff won't be able to read her letter, and Natalie's like, but Tootie, you've got better handwriting than John Hancock. Yeah, and Natalie, Minnie Cone delivers that like she's like, okay, this is a great joke. Yeah. People love this. Nope. Not, People love a Hancock reference. Not a laugh. It was silence. And they, like... They, everyone was like, should we keep, should we keep rolling? And Azad was like, it's fine. Just keep, just keep going. We're almost done. In post. 
Um, I looked up uh, John Hancock's handwriting. Like, we all know about the signature, but I just looked up his handwriting. Because yeah. we know he's got big signature, but that doesn't mean that his handwriting is really good, but it is. It is very good. It is very good. And so I was actually, I was asking my husband, because he knows more about this than I, and I was like, I'm not going to be able to learn why this is, you know, in under an hour. But so one of the reasons why people think that John Hancock, Hancock wrote so big on, on the Declaration of Independence is because he was the president of the Senate and he signed first and was just like, John Hancock, like, I'm going to write big. And then everyone else was like, well, dude, now we have all, oh, we all have to write small. And he's like, oh shit, sorry. You should go first next time. That's like it. He was like, oh, I, sorry, I misread the room. I thought that was the vibe. John Hancock, you know? Imagine getting like a work birthday card with like that kind of size signature on it. You'd be like, what a dick, what a huge dick. And actually Hancock is old timey for huge dick. It translates. The, the cock is the dick part, and hand means huge. In the yeah. Latin hanivorous. Um, anyway, Mrs. Garrett uh, finally gets a clue and asks if Jeff has trouble with reading. And Tootie says, with such spite, that she babysits kids who can read better than him. Yeah, but how good are they at tossing the pigskin? Exactly. Probably not that good. How good are they at fingering you during Jaws 2? Probably not that good. Yeah. How nice are their necklaces? Probably not that good. Exactly. So Nat asks how he's been able to get through school. Tootie says he has friends help him. They give him the answers and they memorize him. I've got some questions about this. It basically sounds like learning. Like we tell him the answers and he memorizes them. Right. The implication, I guess, is that these friends are actually getting the physical tests early. Yeah, and then he's delivering them to him. But how is that a thing that can happen throughout his whole life with such ease? Well, so so I, I only all have all of his classes. I, I only have I have a I have a I have a tiny theory about that. So I think you know, um, in places like I think that okay. So let's say Bates Academy, right? They probably the professors are like old school. It's 1983. They probably don't update all of their their tests and exams every semester. They probably just have them on file. So it's like, if you do bio 101, once you get through that year, then it's gonna be the exact same exam that your older friend who went through the year before knows all the answers to. So sure. they fill it out and then he memorizes it. So, you know, that is that is technically learning, but it is memorization, you know? If he, I mean, if he's getting the tests early, then yes, it's yeah. memorization. But the way that they say it, they never are like, we steal the tests and then we read them to him and tell him the answers. Like, they're just like, we tell him the answers and then he memorizes them. It sounds like learning. It sounds like phonetic learning to me. Yeah. But And that's whatever. not bad. You know, like, that's not the worst thing. It's not like he's paying someone else to take his exams for him. I know, but that's what preppies did in the 80s. And he's not a preppy, he's a jock. Right, that's true. Um, so Mrs. But, Garrett doesn't think these people are his friends. Yeah, so so Mrs. Garrett turns on the most obnoxious, breathy, condescending voice she knows because how. Because she's steamed. The breath is the steam being released. Yeah. His friends, some friends. And then she turns on the shriek and she goes, I'm sorry, but that really steams me. And then basically has to like explain they're cheat. They're not his friends. They're cheating him of his future. And it's like, listen, if he can be, you know, Joe Namath by and get there, by me sheer memorization, you know, that's okay in my book. Yeah, I'm, I'm basically fine with it too, but I, I get it. Um, the, Mrs. Garrett said that these people don't care about Jeff and that makes Tootie's braces well up in tears. And she uh, uh, feels so guilty because apparently Jeff's biology friend was sick. So she, she says, and she stops herself 
which is kind of infuriating because did she steal the test and then read him the answers in between blowjobs? How did she get the test? She doesn't go to Bates. I, I don't understand how she was involved with this. I don't know. Maybe the friend was had the test, but was too sick to fill it out for him. But Tootie knows basic biology and filled it out and taught it to him. I don't know. I don't know either. But it didn't, I, didn't make sense. At this point, this is the thing, is that this is what gets Mrs. Garrett and Natalie really upset. The fact that now Tootie is enabling his lack of being able to read, that he's cheating. And yeah. goes, hey, you didn't. She did. Tootie's worried he's gonna wanna do the same thing for the English exam. Uh, and he, and she should, she just should. I mean, it's one, one exam and then all the colleges are like allowed to go at him, just do it. Yeah. Um, but she uh, does not um, know how to say no is the problem. Miss Garrett's like, you can't say anything else if you want him to get back on the right track. When was he on the right track exactly? Unclear. Yes, very. Um, uh, Mrs. Garrett says something about Tootie being a better friend than the rest of his asshole friends when Jeff saunters into the shop with two glasses of punch which are now much redder than the punch was before, which makes me think that perhaps Cousin Jerry's blood is in it. And uh, it depends on how whiny and suicidal she got about the career opportunity of her lifetime in the other room. Opening for Robert Klein. Yes. Um, everyone leaves because they know this is about to get hella awkward. Oh, yeah. Um, Jeff puts a cup of punch in front of Tootie. She moves it two inches away from her which I felt was weird and passive aggressive. She's like, no. I don't, I can't, I can't accept any of this from you. I don't know anything about this. I don't know where this punch has been. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, so it's like, um, so yeah. Why Mrs. are there turtleneck pieces in my punch? Yeah, so so Mrs. Garrett and Natalie Vamoose, cause they're like, oh shit. And Jeff's like, I'd like to invite you to the party in my pants. To yes, he's got a whole plan for the weekend. He's like, so we're gonna, we're gonna do the pants party that I planned already, right? And Tootie's like, no. And she yells at him and calls him, you know, how all he's going to end up being is an illiterate jock. Yes, well, the pants party was like, I love this, because he was like, so I say we stick around this inventory party for like another 30 minutes until, you know, it winds down. Because right now it's raging. You don't want to miss any of this. Then we go, fuck, then we get a pizza. Yeah. So I kind of I kind of enjoyed how he had like it all laid out. Yeah. And then she's like, "No, you can't read." I know she keep, again. I was like, like the the thing is, is that like I have I have okay. We we firmly established that Tootie is a sociopath, right? Um, which means which technically means, you know, due to you know sort of a clinical um um uh, definition, she's very good at manipulating people. So one would think that Tootie would be able to manipulate Jeff into wanting to learn to read rather than just, and, and the best way to do that is through empathy and understanding rather than, I know babies that can read better than you can. You yeah. dumb fuck. It's keeps, intense. It's yeah, very intense. Over and over again. Over and over again. And he's all like, I know you feel weird about cheating for me, but you did it because you want my hot cock. Like that's supposed to make her feel better. And she's like, I mean, a little, yes, it does make me feel better, but only momentarily. Yes, if she was really his friend, she wouldn't have cheated. And that makes him very angry. Yeah. And, and now, she, and now, now we get into, now we get into the heart of the matter at hand. Yes, she says, what if you get everything you ever wanted, you're on the box of cereal boxes. Box of cereal boxes. Your, your kids idolize you. You got a babe on every arm, all seven. Um, you Whatever, you'd still be an illiterate jock. And it's like, hey, if that's a trade-off, then that's fine. Yeah. Like, if I could be like, if you were like, hey, Dominic, you want to be a football player? Chicks on every arm? Kids idolize you? Here's the thing. You can do that. You just have to not be able to read. Okay. <laughs> sure. Cool. Yeah. So you mean 
you mean that I'm incredibly talented at one thing. I'm rich and famous and I have all of these, you know, Wheaties commercials and sponsorships and whatever. I'm getting laid all the time, you know. So and someone the only can, way I can get my mysteries is like through books on tape. I'm okay with it. Presumably, presumably, you know, uh, someone can drive me around. I've got a babe on each arm. One will yeah. drive me, one will read. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's, that's fine. Great. Um, Titi makes a good point that black people weren't really allowed to learn to read back in the day when they were slaves. Uh, they had to learn in secret. Um, and he doesn't seem to care about this. Uh, but instead of now being in the field, it's, it's a it's a football field. It's well, very no, no, no. subtle. Hold on, you're stepping all over this horrible situation that she has to get out. That's it is horrible. I just yes. So she says. So basically, walk it out for us. So basically, she very earnestly is like, you know, like, come on, man, and which I get. You know, she she likes him. You know, so she basically says, I don't understand you. You know, it used to be that if people, our people, wanted to learn to read. They had to do it in secret. And now, an education is your right. And you're still out on the field. And he's just like, oh shit. I, and at that point, I was like, oh shit, my jaw was on the floor. And then she goes, well, it's a football field, but still. I don't know if I have heard someone say something like that in especially for a show for little girls, something as shocking as that. And something that he's so unbelievable, Jeff, unbelievably blase about. Yeah, no, it's a startling moment. It, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. This, and this was, let's just say this was not written by a person of color. Not to say that that would excuse anything like this, but like, also, the fact that the person who wrote this thought that that was an okay reference to make a 13-year-old girl make on a show for girls. Yeah, as I said, it was startling. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb and say best, less said, the better. Yes. Um, but uh, Tootie does bring up a good point here. I'll tell you what it is. This okay. Is the, this is the good point that Tootie makes. And I believe this is the fact of life this week. Okay. It's not either or. You can play football and know how to read. That's yeah. a good point. That's a point that Jeff should get in his head. I'm glad yeah. someone's saying it. Yeah. Um, and finally, we get to the real point. He thinks he's too sexy and cool to learn how to read. It would hurt his pride. Uh, so rather than spending all that time learning to read, he'd rather spend it memorizing tests that he forces his friends to steal. Um, and he also believes that in order to learn to read, he'd have to sit at a tiny desk and chair like a fourth grader, and that just wouldn't look cool. Fair enough, it wouldn't. But also, I, I don't, I don't, I feel like that would be a very easy thing to dissuade him of. You can learn to read however you want. Uh, let me show you this big chair and desk that you could learn to read on. Yes, you could wear a smoking jacket and have a pipe. You could have put on a silly hat. Yeah. Um, then Tootie points out that that's not pride, it's ego. And he's like, semantics, bitch, it's how I feel. <laughs> um, he's worried that people will find out, they'll lose respect for him, and he will lose everything. And Tootie's like, I know, and you haven't lost me. And they hug. And honestly, if she didn't say that, I could see us never seeing Jeff again. But because she said that, now it's like, I think you're stuck with Jeff forever. Yeah. And she is. Yeah. And that is our episode. Yeah. That was a good one. No. Okay. So uh, it, the, re the only reason why I, not the only reason, obviously, but I think that, they, that, 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 that this show, this episode squandered the, you know, I never learned to read moment. You know, which, you know, is kind of at this point a huge cliche in sitcoms and films. You know, I never learned to read, you know. Um, but I do think that um, this could have been less of a, like, to now Tootie's implicated because she helped him t cheat. It should have just been, like, I'm going to help you 
And we're going to get through this together. That would have been, I mean, that is what I think they're kind of ending on. Yeah, but Mrs. Garrett and Natalie were like, Tootie, I can't believe you would do something like this. And it's like, she helped her boyfriend on one test. You know, she's feeling guilty. This isn't that bad. But like, I do think the, 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 the important thing is to encourage him to learn how to read rather than scream at him for half an hour about how she knows babies who can read better than he can. I'll agree with that. I think that's a good point. <laughs> um, yeah, and so that is our episode. Um, I did uh, just a tiny bit of research um, yes. to make sure. And yes, we have two more Cousin Jerry episodes left. Great. Are they so, soon? Um, at least one of them is soon. I believe they're both this season. Great. So we're gonna we're gonna get we're gonna clear out the Cousin Jerry episodes. Um, and uh, next week we have what I believe is widely considered a fan favorite episode. Ooh. Yes, it is. <coughs> Ooh. Excuse me. Certainly one of my favorites. Um, and it is one of two very notable Halloween episodes. Ooh. I'm so excited. I love the Halloween episodes. Do you or are you being sarcastic? No, of course. If people don't like a Halloween episode, then there's something wrong with them because there's so much fun. Uh, they only do two of them in their, in the series. Both of them are among my favorite Facts of Life episodes. So oh, yeah. I think the next one's better, but this one's really good. They're both, they, they, you will not find a thing to complain about in these episodes. I'm certain. The podcast is going to be 22 minutes long because we're just going to say everything that happened and then applaud. Okay. Should I, should I dress up in a Halloween costume for it? Yeah, that will. This will be our Halloween episode. We it will be airing right at Halloween time. So if you would like to get a costume for this next episode, um, say it now because our audience is going to expect it. I mean, I've got, I've got, I've got items in this house that could be used as a as as a costume. So but I'm ready. We are in costume for the Halloween episode, and right. you know what? I'm going to go out on a limb and make it a tradition since there's only two Halloween episodes. And the next That's one is several years down the road. I think we can commit to that. Yeah. Halloween episodes in costume only on the Facts of Facts. <laughs> That's right. Um, all right. Well, Britt, it was always lovely getting to chat with you. I'm mm -hmm. really happy we're back in the rhythm of it. I miss doing this with you. And this was super fun, as always. And next week will be so much fun because there's nothing that we need to worry about, about, you know, people, you know, not knowing how to read and there's gonna be no raping it's gonna be a nice episode just halloween spooky stuff fun <laughs> I, you were like it's nice piece good it's gonna be a good episode it's gonna be nice it's gonna be real good it's gonna be really gonna, gonna, gonna not gonna be a lot of stuff about reading there's not gonna be any raping you know it's gonna be good it's gonna be good no reading no raping it's great no reading and no raping <laughs> anyway all right well until next time Oh, did I, oh, did you have a, a nice sign off for us this time? I always do the sign off, and I never do them well. Why don't you give us a sign off this time? Um, <laughs> I can't. Uh, I feel like Natalie, but like worse than Natalie, because you put me on the spot and I couldn't come up with something. Hold on, I got something. No, actually, I don't. Um, but uh, I think that I'm excited for Jeff's journey into literacy. Great. What a perfect <laughs> thing to end the podcast with. So, <laughs> bye guys. We are excited for Jeff's journey into literacy. We will see you next time. Okay. <laughs>